Hello and welcome to this new episode of the WCO Integrity Web Series hosted by the WCO's Anti-Corruption and Integrity Promotion Program. We have discussed last week what the WCO is doing about corruption. We are going to see this week how we can talk about corruption in customs, which can often be a sensitive topic. To do so, we have here with us today Carlos Enriquez Montes, Mexican Minister Representative to the EU and the WCO. Carlos is also the chair of the WCO Integrity Subcommittee and has been largely involved in the ACID program. Good afternoon, Carlos, and thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is a great honor for me to participate in this very important initiative. And as you rightly pointed out, it is a sensitive but also a crucial topic for discussion. So I trust that this web series will be very valuable and useful to the WCO members and all the public interested in what we are doing at the WCO to promote integrity in customs administrations. Thank you, Carlos. We heard in a previous episode that although corruption occurs everywhere, there are certain features that make customs a specific target. Often, there are also severe consequences for society as a whole when customs authority is abused. That being said, people often feel customs is unfairly or disproportionately blamed. How, therefore, do you propose we talk about this quite difficult subject? Well, as controversial or sensitive it can be, we must be able to openly speak about corruption. And the World Customs Organization has an approach that can really help us to get to this question head on. We should feel that we can talk about corruption and customs in the same sentence without bringing too much baggage. And this is an important thing to do, given the role that customs have and the impact that corruption in the environment can have. So I would say this is the why. Now we can discuss the how. So our starting point is that corruption is a human behavior. We acknowledge that when we talk about all the forms of corruption. Ultimately, what we're talking about is what humans are doing, our decisions, our choices, the way we behave. And starting from there, it gives us two opening points to tackle this discussion. First, we can speak collectively. As a human behavior, corruption is a problem that in one way or another, we all may face at some point in our lives. We also know it does not happen only in customs. And this is very important to acknowledge. It can happen in any sector or activity. And this also helps to start the discussion without necessarily singling anyone out or giving them reason to be defensive. In other words, there is no intention to blame anyone. Seeing this from the us problem perspective is also a starting point to acknowledge in a very pragmatic way that this is something that we all have a responsibility in addressing. Recognizing the collective action is key in approaching this issue. It is us and we, not you and them. Second, we can speak optimistically. Recognizing corruption is a human behavior, we know that human behavior is not static. It changes based on our context. For example, we act differently with our boss than with our children, or at least I would expect that. And this gives a window to acknowledge this is a human behavior that can be changed. We are not born with a corruption gene. We behave in a way that reacts to external stimulus, our context, the circumstances we're operating in. And the good news is that this context can be changed. By seeing corruption in this sense, we can feel encouraged to look at the next step in the process, which is what can we do to change human behavior? And this will lead us to feel more optimistic that things can change. So corruption, and I would say more importantly, integrity, is actually something to discuss and act on collectively and to talk optimistically about. That's interesting. You say we can talk about the topic optimistically, but yet we often hear, oh, this is such a big problem. I'm not sure we can do anything about that. That's just how it is. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we do hear this a lot, yet we can change the context if we choose and decide to do so. 
perhaps not everything and not overnight, because of course there's many things we can't control, but we can change some little things in some areas and it's something to be moving forward from. So we can be optimistic and also be practical and recognize that by breaking the problem down and looking at what it is within our power or control to change, we'll have a potential practical solution ahead of us. We know many forms of corruption exist. For example, bribery, extortion, chronism, and so on. And we can spend some time and energy identifying and chasing after all of them, all of which can have difficult impact on customs environment, both in terms of revenue and the overall disruption to operations. It is important to recognize these different forms of corruption exist, but what is important is really finding the specific context and drivers that create those corrupt behaviors in the first place. As you see here in the diagram, for those of you who are familiar with the game uh, in this picture, you see that you can spend a lot of time trying to predict and hit each one as they come up, or you can look for the source or drivers and tackle the problem directly from there. Over time, through various WCO integrity activities, and particularly via the WCO Anti-Corruption and Integrity Promotion Program, ACIP, which is funded by the Norwegian Agency for Development and Cooperation, NORAD, we have observed some common drivers to corruption in customs that arise from certain contextual situations. You might have already heard about them during the WCO integrity uh, subcommittee discussions that we've had or read about it in the WCO news magazine, which has uh, published uh, a series of articles related to integrity. And the most common drivers that we have observed are functional, desperate, expected, opportunistic, and coercive. Functional corruption can often occur when procedures are difficult, opaque, or burdensome. Given the, sensi the sensitivity of trade to time and cost, these can often incentivize or drive people to cut corners. We see facilitation payments and other similar forms of bribery arising from this. So in other words, the power or corrupting the processes simply to, to put things in order or to get things done. And this is, this is not a good thing to do. Desperate corruption is one of the trickiest. We see these in situations when staff are underpaid or experiencing some sort of financial hardship. They are driven towards corrupt behaviors simply in order to make ends meet. Expected corruption is when everyone else in the room thinks this sort of behavior should be the norm. An officer, for example, might not even think about committing a corrupt act until he or she is asked to do so. And they would not be asked to do so if there wasn't already some sort of expectation that the office is corruptible. Linked to this, we also often see a certain assumption that if you are not taking advantage of your personal situation like everyone else supposedly is, you are not being smart. Opportunistic corruption is when there are little or no controls. So it is easy to choose the wrong way. The money is right there on the table. Nobody's watching you. All you need to do is to take it. And finally, coercive corruption. This is when overwhelming influence from others can affect people's decisions and behaviors. There can be very direct coercion, even involving violence, or it can be indirect, such as the one we often see in political interference. So here we see how these common drivers can arise specifically in the context of customs administration and their operations. Yes, we, we saw some of those uh, specific features of the customs environment in a previous episode. This is very interesting now to see how these can be linked with potential drivers for corruption. 
In that previous episode, we also learned about the WCO revised outage operation as a key policy document for customs administrations looking to tackle the issue of corruption. We will also look at this instrument in more detail in a future episode of this web series. But could you just share with us briefly if and how the WCO revised outage declaration links with the discussion of corruption behaviors, drivers, and contexts? Yes, certainly. As previously mentioned, when we talk about corruption in customs, we can talk collectively, optimistically, and pragmatically. The 10 key factors of the World Customs Organization revised Arusha Declaration offer exactly that pragmatic approach. As we can see here, each of the contexts and drivers of corruption can potentially be addressed by implementing specific key factors that the revised Arusha Declaration recommends. For example, those drivers to functional corruption relating to a context of complex and burdensome procedures can be addressed by implementing changes under key factors that are related to regulatory framework and customs reform and modernization. These key factors focus on transparency, simplification, and harmonization of procedures, as well as maximizing efficiencies. So by effectively addressing these areas, the incentive to cut corners will be removed from the equation, so the drivers of functional corruption disappear. Other examples given here show that several key factors can be linked to certain changes in the context, depending on which drivers of corruption are drawing focus. So this really is an excellent way of illustrating the intentions behind the WCO revised Arusha Declaration, as it helps provide changes in the context that will, in turn, change behaviors in a customs environment. Thank you, Carlos. It was an insightful presentation that laid the picture of several other points that we will tackle in more details uh, in future episodes. We hope you like this new episode of the WCU Integrity web series and we'll see you soon. Thank you.